Uh, this year we're given the task of designing a new mustering helicopter that we've called the Matador. So cattle stations in Australia are really large properties. In fact, they're pretty much as large as some small uh, countries. Um, on these properties, cattle are free to disperse throughout the property, and during the dry season they need to be mustered and herded so that they can be collected for sale. Um, so mustering is a process that incorporates helicopters, ground vehicles, and horse-mounted musterers. Um, in, they work in combination to collect the cattle, and the Australian Rangeland Society has quoted that aerial mustering is 12% more efficient than horse um, back mounted mustering alone. So currently R22 is in use for mustering, however they were designed in the 70s and they feature very outdated technology, unlike the Matador, which has been designed and optimised for um, mustering purposes. So mustering is a process that involves very extreme manoeuvres with close proximity to the ground. Um, and therefore it's inherently dangerous. Um, there are numerous crashes involving R22 helicopters, and this has led to the, the project having a hard specification of safety. So this reduces the engineering costs of the helicopter and reduces the risk to the pilots themselves. So I'd now like to ask Daniel to come up and speak about some of the safety features. So energy absorbing devices are lighter than the survivability of the occupants in the event of a crash, um, because they are there to absorb the energy. Um, for a conventional helicopter, there are three main energy absorbing components. There's the skids, the floor, and the seat. As our emphasis is on safety, we um, decided to take this further and incorporate a specific energy absorbing subfloor, as well as the stroking seat for the pilot. Um, so the stroking seat is designed to stroke downwards um, in the event of an accident, bringing the occupant to a halt um, via the absorption of energy. Um, there are many different ways of absorbing this energy, um, most of which include the deformation of materials. An example of this is a tube being crushed or um, inverted or torn. Um, another example is a metal wire which is pulled through a series of pulleys. Um, for our particular design, we decided to um, use the crushing of tube. Um, so as you can see, the seat which the occupant is um, strapped into is connected to this four collar tube. And so in the event of a crash, these four colors slide down the supporting structure, crushing these two aluminium tubes, um, which are there to absorb the energy. We decided to go with the crushing tubes because it's a compact design, because as you can see, the whole um, energy absorbing device is located within the structure of the seat itself, and so um, extra mounting points such as on the roof are not needed. This is very important as John will explain on later, our cockpit is quite um, compact, and so having a compact seat like this <coughs> is quite ideal. I'll now like to introduce Desmond who will talk about the energy absorbing support. So for the energy absorbing support, a honeycomb design was chosen. So for its improved attributes and properties. So this is as compared to say a layout material to absorb the energy in the event of a crash. So how these energy absorbing subfloors work is that it is made up of many thin wall columns and it absorbs energy through the bending and folding of these columns. Um, and it was found in a study that the most effective shape for energy absorption in, for, for these thin wall columns would be in the shape of an excrement. So for the energy absorbing subfloor, uh, we would use aluminium alloy. Why we, we didn't use a composite instead would be that with the use of composites, it would be very hard to predict the behavior of the composites in a scenario of a crash. Also, with, uh, with composites, it will be much more expensive to manufacture as opposed to aluminium alloy. Other important properties with, with the use of aluminium alloy would be it will have excellent strength weight ratio and will be easy to machine to its desired shape. Now, as well as the present, we will talk about the tail rotor and the pump. Okay, so the drive shaft that um, goes to the tail right up is a very heavy component and it's a major cause of vibrations. Um, so it was a real goal for our design team to get rid of this shaft. Um, so we did this by creating an electric propulsion system. Now the system features an alternator which is connected to the engine. It provides power for this ME215 electric motor. Uh, the motor drives the tail rotor directly. Um, so the only linkage between the two is a uh, cable, an electric cable. Um, the reason we chose the ME215 was for its high efficiency over range speed. Um, this is because we actually changed the thrust of the tail rotor by changing the speed of the rotor itself. 
Uh, we also went with a ducted tailor-rated design. Um, this helps us meet our specification of safety. This is because the duct provides some shielding against tail strikes, um, but also has some secondary effects, such as increased aerodynamic performance. Um, we also made this uh, component modular. So upon maintenance, you can actually remove the entire unit itself and then just replace it with another unit. Um, since our yaw control is electric, we decided to go with an all-electric control system. For this, we required um, actuation for the swash plates. So this is done via three electrohydrostatic actuators located at the hull. Um, the reason we went with these um, actuators was because um, the hydraulic system is contained completely within the unit. So there's reservoirs, pumps, filters, it's all compact. Um, it's actually used in A380 at the moment, so it's proven to be reliable and useful. Um, it essentially just simplifies our design and makes it uh, very reliable. So I'll now pass on to Glenn and we'll talk more about the propulsion system. Thank you, Brett. Um, in choosing a propulsion system for our helicopter, we, we bring ourselves to two main parts. Eastern and one engine. Now, in helicopters of our class, most engines are in the eastern type. The problem with piston engines is that they're generally quite unreliable and there's very short time to The problem with the short term time uh, between the time to the airport is that in the bush, it's really inaccessible to get an engine service to so often. So, in our case, we've chosen the turbine engine. The reason for this is if we want a greater reliability, which means our safety speed, and secondly, mainly for that longer time to the We don't really need to maintain things much. Specifically, our engine, our turbine engine, is a solar T62. Some of you may know it is actually the APU of the uh, chiller. But in our case, we've chosen an operating version. It's a solar T62 slash 190 designed by West Power Systems. Which is 190 horsepower, which is a critical time of 42 kilowatts. To pair up this engine, we have the gearbox. The standard gearbox has many problems, as, as some of you may know. Its planetary gears have wall bearings, which will wear against the shafts. Now, the wear against the shafts cause some metal to fall and contaminates our system, which is not a good thing, unfortunately. The solution that we've found is a company called UGI Incorporated. They've got a Mark 17 gearbox, which has a one connection to the planetary gear set. What they add is a secondary induction, which completely solves this weight issue, which therefore means, means our system is all the same. And as you can see here on the left, that's the secondary induction that you use, and that's the whole Mark 17 gearbox. To pair up the main gearbox with the main rotodrives, the API also has a Mark 18 gearbox. So the main rotodrive is a 90 degree high force. And on the figure on the left here is a pin and blur adhesive. The pin and blur adhesive is a really important feature because in any, in any case of dust injection, the issue with dust and negated because the ears are not On the figure on the right here, you can see it is a rotor frame, pretty much like a regular display in uh, That can stop the rotors from spinning in the event of an accident. So they manually cut the bottle for 9 to 10 seconds. So in the event of an accident, but uh, stop the main rotors from spinning by one degree, and so they can also Now, I'll um, um, do the other one to stop that one there. Okay, after listening to all the interesting features, I'm sure you are very curious to look what's inside the cockpit. And the thing would be the tandem seating. Okay, we have the capacity to put in another passenger, so this is actually to compare with other helicopters in our class. So the passenger seat is actually a foldable jump seat at the back, which when there is no passengers, you can actually put in a tight arm storage and install the back. And then the vision. A mastering helicopter, the entire helicopter is designed uh, mainly for the pilots because the uh, mastering helicopters perform maneuvers that are very close to the ground and they they have to concentrate on their work rather than doing um, them doing anything else. So, as you can see, it's a red round, there's very close proximity glass to prevent parabolic errors, and the bar on there is the other for example. Alright, and the next one will be the complete display. As you can see, it's a minimalistic layout. Um, how many of you find that you get distracted in the cars by your LEDs, LCDs, and many buttons and screens? Well, unlike that, we um, actually choose a minimalistic by only showing the important details, the important um, dolls, 
they're mastering harder than me, and I'm not wanting to get distracted. And instead of using LEDs and LCDs, we use analog dolls because they are very easy to see at a glance. And the ones on top are warning lights. The warning lights replace all the other important information that indicate emergency landings procedures. And fun ones will Alright, thank you, Jenna. So now, you, well, I'll talk to you about how we went about designing the structure of uh, the material. Firstly, here's a brief uh, flowchart. It's a very simplified one, and this is kind of how we went about designing the structure. Uh, firstly, individually, we brainstormed. The reason that we didn't do it as a team because, is because we wanted everyone's thoughts on the design so you could get different opinions and all avenues to analyze. And then during the team meetings, we revised the design and created a first iterative a geometry. Then we carried out finite element analysis. And then following that, we decided on the loads and uh, we studied the loads and the load distribution. And then we revised the structure again. And it must be noted that when designing the structure, manufacturing concern, considerations were always kept in the back of the head. So at every step, we thought, you know, is this feasible to manufacture? Is there any way of existing technology that we can manufacture? And then we constantly uh, kept on developing and modifying, which was an iterative process, and then finally sized our structures. And if you have noticed from the previous pictures, that uh, the Matado features a space frame structure. Whereas the Matado's direct competitor, the Robinson R22, that is currently used in mass sharing, has a same amount of structure. The reason that we went for a, a space frame structure is it's relatively lighter. And then also must kept, kept, we kept in mind that the R22 is specifically designed for mass sharing. So it, it, it will be operating in rural regions of Australia. So it has to be very reliable and durable. And also, because it will be doing low-level maneuvers, it needs to be relatively damage tolerant due to the due to the debris that will be caused by it because of the downrush from the main rotors. Uh, and now I'll introduce you to Lincoln, my colleague, that will be talking about how we carried out the analysis. Thank you, Chris. On the brainstorming, brainstorming session, the initial form initial configurations were drafted, and the finalized geometry was created using the computational software platform. This was in order to analyze um, the, thing, the structure, uh, in order to size and analyze the structure, the Final analysis was carried out using Factrack and the post analysis was done using Excel. The material properties of Cromoly indicate that it's an ultimate tensile strength of 670 megapascals and yield tensile strength of 435 megapascals, which is rated the most steel alloys used in today's helicopters. In fact, if the Matador operates under the endurance limit, then, the, then there should be no factory issues involved. Uh, and thus, the space frame structure should be more durable as the effective back of the structure should increase. <coughs> oh, and corrosion is also another factor which affects the safety of the helicopter space frame as it will eventually degrade the material properties of the homoly. In order to prevent this from happening, a protective coating like paint is uh, applied to the um, Structure so that it provides a barrier <coughs> between the structure and the mass frame environment. The Cromoly space frame also increases the um, also increases the damage tolerance of the uh, manifold structure, as it um, also has as a, has a high strength to weight ratio pool, suitable for optimizing the strength of the structural members, whilst also minimizing the weight of the structure. The safety feature of the roll bar within the cockpit box also helps increase the damage tolerance as it as the strategic placements of the roll bar help in the low transition, uh, converting it from a cantilevered structure to a simply supported beam. This helps in reducing the bending moments being experienced by the structure and also helps optimize the energy absorbing features of a metal. Um, so moving on, if you notice we're using chromoly tubing. The reason for choosing chromoly tubing is the cylindrical tubing is very important as the orientation of the tubing does not, um, the moment of inertia of the tubing is independent.
dependent on the orientation. This, come, this comes critical when it comes to manufacturing because there's less concern of the design orientation and the manufactured orientation. So the, uh, the structure can be manufactured easily. Also, when sizing the structure, it was um, standard manufacturing sizing sizes we use. Therefore, it is readily available off the shelf and there's no need to go to a manufacturer and tell them you want a specific size. And also, these uh, tubings are prefabricated and are readily available all around the world. Um, another reason for going with uh, chromoly is its uh, weldability. Chromoly is rated excellent when it comes to weldability. If you notice, a space frame is made up of several different sizes of members, and these members needed to be bonded together. For instance, if we went with aluminium, aluminium is really poor when it comes to weldability. And then we also need to remember that we're designing a purely uh, a, a helicopter that is purely designed for mass steering. So it's necessary that the cost is minimized. So it's, it, it has to be cost efficient so that we can sell it out as well. So by having a chromoly structure, it's cheaper and also it's easier to manufacture. And also small, uh, small damages could be easily repaired if there is any kind of metal working uh, equipment available on site. Rather than sabotaging the mission, these small damages could be possibly repaired and, repaired and the mission can carry on further. When designing the structure, vibrational loads was also considered. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, we could not carry out analysis, but the sources of vibration and there were steps taken on how we could, uh, how we could uh, carry these loads. So the main sources of vibration is the main rotating rotor, the uh, ductile tail rotor, the engine, and the gearbox. So these vibrational loads will be transferred into the structure. Uh, here's a good example. Let's say you're dri driving down the Sydney Harbour Bridge. There's no dampener in your car, and all of a sudden your car starts vibrating. All that vibrating energy is transferred into you, and you start shaking. You can't see the road clearly, you can't read the dashboard, you can't read the speedometer. And if the inevitable circumstances, either you drive into the neighboring lane or you drive off the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And I don't want that to be the fate of our helicopter. That's why we have decided to install in, uh, vibration isolators in the cockpit that will shield vibrational energy from being transferred from the structure into the pilot and the avionics, thereby improving his visibility and also he can concentrate on the equipment and then he's not distracted. So this improves the safety <coughs> operation. And also at the moment that the vibration of dampers, we will reduce or minimize the amount of energy that will be transferred into the structure. Oh, and when we were designing the engine and gearbox mount, in addition to the weight, there were some other loads considered as well. For instance, the torsional rod, because there are rotating members within the gearbox and the engine. So there had to be countertop members installed to prevent it from rotating when, when the engine and gearbox start rotating. And also, the engine and gearbox needs to be, be removable for servicing. So this also was kept in mind. When designing the structure, this illustration here shows how the engine could be removed and bodied away for servicing. As you can see, the, um, in the first image, the cross member in the tail strut is made in such a way it's removable, so that it provides, the, provides enough space for the engine to be lowered and removed away for servicing. And now, Sandy will talk to you about how the Matador performs against its direct competitor, the Robinson Artillery. Um, yeah, now I would like to compare the specifications of our helicopter uh, to that of the R22. The reason why the R22 was chosen for this comparison is because, as Brenton mentioned before, uh, our helicopter is aimed at replacing the R22 for mastering purposes. Firstly, the endurance of our helicopter is significantly better than that of the R22. This is highly desirable as it means that mastering can be carried out for a longer period of time for um, building is necessary. The power to weight ratio of our helicopter is also much better than that of the R22, which leads to better maneuverability. The cause of the significant increase in the power to weight ratio is due to the fact that we have chosen to use a turbine engine, which is much more powerful compared to the piston engine, which is used by the R22, while the weight of both helicopters remains uh, more or less the same. It should be noted that the tail boom of our helicopter is shorter than that of the R22. The causes of many crashes of the R22 and helicopters in general is due to the tail strike during the landing and low altitude maneuvering. 
Therefore, minimizing the length of the tail boom minimizes the possibility of a tail strike and effectively uh, improves the general safety of the helicopter. And now I would like to pass over to Krishan, who will conclude this presentation. Thank you. So, for nearly the past 20 minutes, uh, the team and I have been discussing about the features in the Matador and how it is performing. So, now we'll have a brief uh, summary and conclusion of our features. So firstly, the Matador is being designed because currently the Robinson R22 is used for mastering. It wasn't designed for mastering. So the, the Matador features an energy absorbing system during a crash. That is the subflow and the stroking seat. It has an electric ducted fan and also has an electronic control system, electrohydrostatic actuators, which are used in the A380. And it has a minimalized cockpit layout to ensure that the pilot isn't distracted during operation. The structures have been uh, designed in such a way safety is kept in mind, and there are vibration dampers. And also, Sandy described on how, in spite of all these added features in terms of safety, the performance of the Matador isn't inhibited. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude saying we as the designers of Matador strongly believe that if the Matador is unleashed into the Australian outback, the skies of Australia would be a much safer place. Thank you for your attention.
control was twisted the throttle, which you can't have the two of them. It's a good price for full authority and digital protection control. Uh, no. No. Very expensive. But if the R22, you just twist the throttle and it's very hard to over tool or overpower. It's very easy to over tend to do it. Um, could somebody elaborate a little bit on the rotor head design and the, and the control system? Um, the tower is fine. Um, how does it actually, and you say it's not got variable speed, but varying thrust by varying speed, right? Um, there's obviously a power supply to the electric motor. How is the, how does the control system work? Is that electric motor controlled digitally? Uh, yes, I believe it has a motor control which um, changes the signal to the electric motor. Okay, and the same with the rotor head, right? Uh, the main rotor head um, is actually a mechanical link in this one. As well as the electro uh, It's an electric actuator that we control this one. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay, okay. the electric yeah. actuator is controlled by ones and zeros going down one, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. You've probably bought yourself about a $10 million certification for it. <laughs> because that would have to be done, that would have to be certified to the same standard as the other one, and it would have to be at least double done. Okay. I speak I speak with some authority on that because I'm three quarters of the way through the design project at the moment on a single channel fly by wire system for a Robinson R forty four. Right, which is yeah, you know, quality for other than the middle one. What sort of rotor head design are you using and how does that relate to the landing gear? Um to mean the, the flattening mechanism. So we yeah, use well, what, what is it a semi rigid system or yeah, it's a semi rigid teetering system. It's a teetering system, okay. yeah, for its simplicity. Okay, that's good. But how does that relate to the landing gear? Uh, in what way do you mean, sorry? I'm talking at ground resonance. Uh, a lot of the vibration stuff we haven't considered due to time constraints. I think you, you can't get ground resonance from the two blade teetering rotor. That was the answer, I was Absorption uh, mechanism for the passenger seat. 
Um, so yeah, the passenger, because when you must bring the OG to the end, you're going to get a bit of a lot of So the passenger was kind of the, got a bit, got a bit annoying. Um, yeah, but he's, 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 he's in a, um, sort of a trip style jump seat, so the military has a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's kind of waiver if you're a passenger. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're not very intense in maneuvering while the passenger is moving more just to get from point A to point B. Yeah, so um, I think you guys have a sense of driver inside 27. Yeah, yeah, it's a um, the, other, the other point I'd make too is that in fact all these pressure lizards are still mandatory anyway. Right, so when I mean, you go to the inventory um, box. The reason R22s are used in monitoring is not because they're a train to look at them, it's not. Right, the reason they're used is because they're cheap. Right. So one's got a 150 horsepower piston engine, the other's got a 120 horsepower turbine engine, um, a massive certification program to try and get the swap of horses.